making direct statements of protest. This is our third annual Jesse Redmond Fawcett Literary Series, and we're funded by a grant from the New Jersey Council for Humanities, the Camden County Cultural and Heritage Commission at Camden County College and Walmart Foundation through its local store in Somerdale. We have an exciting program for you today. We're going to have some poetry by our young people from the area this afternoon. Um, so at this time, will you please join me in singing a verse of the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing, and you will find it in your program. Would you please stand? Okay. All right, here we go. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let us rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Sing a song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. Facing the rising sun of a new day begun, let us march on till victory is won. Thank you. You may be seated. <clears throat> At this time, we will have a proclamation read by our uh, borough council, uh, Mrs. Sylvia Venaki. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen and children. On behalf of mayor and council, I will read the proclamation. It's from the office of the mayor. Declaring April the 19th and the 20th of 2013, Jesse Redmond Fawcett Day. Whereas Jesse Redmond Fawcett was born in Snow Hill, the old name for Lawnside, on April the 26th, 1882. And whereas Langston Hughes called Mrs. Fawcett the midwife of the Harlem Renaissance because she nurtured writers and provided an outlet and paid them for their work. And whereas her father was the Reverend Redmond Fawcett, who was pastor of the Mount Pisgah African and Methodist Episcopal Church here in Lawnside. And whereas Jesse Redmond Fawcett received her education in Philadelphia. She was a 1905 graduate of Cornell University and earned a master's excuse me, and earned a master's degree in French from the University of Pennsylvania and studied at the Sorbonne, and where she wrote four novels, numerous poems and short stories, and was the literary educator, literary editor of The Crisis, the major intellectual civil rights publication by the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People. And whereas the Lawnside Historical Society will be honoring Jesse Redmond Fawcett on Friday, April the 19th, 2013, and Saturday, April the 20th, 2013, at the Lawnside Public School. And whereas on Friday, April the 19th, 2013, Dr. Herman Beavers, 
the University of Pennsylvania will be the keynote speaker. And whereas on Saturday, April the 20th, which is today, 2013, Dr. Evie Shockley, Rutgers University, will be the keynote speaker for us today. And whereas all winners of the sixth annual Spirit of the Renaissance Poetry Competition will be held at both events. Now therefore, be resolved that April the 19th and April the 20th, 2013, is Jesse Redmond Fawcett Days, and all citizens are urged to join the Lawnside Historical Society in recognizing Mrs. Fawcett's impact among scholars, academics, history buffs, and book lovers. It is signed by the mayor of Lawnside, which is Marianne Warlow. Thank you for that reading. Jesse Redmond Fawcett was an interesting lady. Uh, for you young people, you probably can't realize 1905 graduating from college because you were probably born in the late 80s and 90s. But uh, that is an interesting time for a young woman. At this time, I'd like to introduce our Master of Ceremonies. Uh, his name is Dr. Cord Whitaker. His, bio his biography is in the program, but I want to, uh, to make a note that Dr. Whitaker was Master of Ceremonies for the, is Master of Ceremonies for this series, was our keynote speaker in 2011, and he has helped the society tremendously in developing this literary series and the annual poetry competition. Dr. Whitaker holds undergraduate and graduate degrees from Yale and Duke universities, and we are very fortunate that one of his many prestigious fellowships have brought him back to this area. He is a Lawnside native. At this time, I present Dr. Cord Whitaker. Thank you very much for that introduction, Ms. Fowler. Uh, it's always good to be before you in Lawnside and in South Jersey and in the Philadelphia area more generally. Um, it's my great honor to be Master of Ceremonies today. And part of that honor is letting you know about a whole bunch of important stuff that you have to, that you really ought to keep in mind, that you ought to participate in, and so on and so forth. But the first thing I'm going to share with you, um, we were honored, we've been honored to receive a, uh, a commendation from Senator Frank Lautenberg. And I just want to read a few words from that today. Um, he writes, I am pleased to recognize the many students who submitted entries in this year's Renaissance Poetry Competition, who have no doubt been inspired by great writers such as Ms. Jessie Redmond Fawcett. As we honor Ms. Fawcett's literary work, we recall her life during which she accomplished much in her many roles as teacher, editor, novelist, poet, and short story writer. When Ms. Fawcett became the literary editor of the National Advancement for uh, of Colored People's Crisis Magazine, she provided many authors with encouragement, giving them an outlet for their creativity. It is through her promotion and publication of these works that she acquired the name the midwife of the Harlem Renaissance. It is with pride and respect that this Renaissance poetry competition is held in memory of Jesse Redmond Fawcett, an individual who played a critical role not only in the Harlem Renaissance, but in our American culture as a whole. Thanks to all the participants who continue to make this tribute a success, and a special congratulations to the winners of this year's poetry competition. I wish you all the best with your future literary endeavors. Sincerely, Frank R. Lautenberg. Now, I also want to um, let you know about a few other things. There, in your seat, along with your program, you would have found a white survey. Fill that out. Um, and be sure to drop it off over there in that box right in front of Ms. Fowler at the end of the day because um, we are really fortunate 
that this event, this, this, uh, this competition as well, is funded in part by the New Jersey Council for the Humanities. And they like feedback, and we want to stay funded by them, and we want to keep this poetry competition going. So for those reasons, please fill out that form, because that will help, help us keep doing that. Thanks. Um, also want to, to remind you of, be reminded for some, new knowledge for others, that one of the main projects of the Lawnside Historical Society is the Peter Mott House Underground Railroad Museum. And um, if you have never visited it, you really, really should. It's open to visitors every Saturday um, from noon to three, most Saturdays from noon to three, and groups can visit by appointment as well. Visit www.petermotthouse.org for more information on that. Um, I told you I had a few things to let you know about. We're not done yet. There's a little more. Um, you should also uh, be aware that if you're if you are a, a black history buff, if you're into the history of slavery, it's important to know there's more than one Underground Railroad Museum in the area. Right? So there's also the Underground Railroad Coalition of Delaware, who the Lawnside Historical Society and the Peter Mott House Foundation are organizing together with. So Monday, April 29th, if you happen to be free from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m., um, the Underground Railroad Coalition of Delaware is having its annual meeting. Um, that's going to be held at a, a 111 Buttonwood Avenue in Newcastle, Delaware. And I believe we're trying to gather a group together to go from here. Is that correct? Leaving from the Peter Mott House? Leaving from the Peter Mott House. So if you are interested in that, please do see president of the Historical Society, Ms. Linda Shockley, or me. Thanks. Um, and there's more. So many of you here have just participated in a poetry contest. I happen to know that those of us who like poetry sometimes also do visual art, too. There's another contest. So what you should know is that a it, we're, we're really fortunate this year to have in this area a visiting artist from Port-au-Prince, Haiti, named Frandi Jean. Frandi Jean is how it's spelled. And while he grew up in Port-au-Prince um, and taught himself how to really excel in watercolor uh, and illustration, and got to the point where he was being commissioned to work on um, several, uh, to work on illustrations for children's books and stuff. Then the earthquake hit in January of 2010. And uh, he was, he fortunately survived, though, and he escaped unharmed, but his art and supplies did not. Fortunately, he happened to soon meet up with some patrons of the arts here in South Jersey who happened to be in Haiti on a volunteer trip after that earthquake. And they have brought him here as a visiting artist. He now has a gallery on Station Avenue in Haddon Heights, the Friend Dijon Gallery, just opened a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, he has taken it upon himself to open up an art contest. So if you are a visual artist, you need to participate in this. Um, there are little green uh, handouts over there. You'll want to get one before you leave, where it gives the details of the contest. They say calling all teen artists on top of them. Um, and you can, you can also go to arttruistic.org when you get home. So that's on these little green sheets as well. And you know, there's all sorts of fun parts of this, like um, cash prizes. Uh, you know, up to four, over $400 in awards are being given out. And it's open to all students in grades 8 through 12. All right. So that brings me to the end of the announcements. But keep those things in mind. Pick up materials before you leave today so that you can participate in these great opportunities. Now, now that that is said, 
It is my next great pleasure to share with you a few thoughts about Jesse Redmond Fawcett and this year's, this year's contest theme, Poetry as Protest. We're engaged here when we do poetry. We're engaged in a local and a global endeavor at one time. And what do I mean by that? Because you're probably thinking, well, you wrote your poem in your house or in your room. You're here in Lawnside School. This all seems pretty local, right? It doesn't seem terribly global, but it is. Um, when we're engaged in something like this, we're celebrating something bigger than ourselves, bigger than this space and bigger than any one of us. We are remembering something. We are considering something central to our very existence. We're celebrating, remembering, and considering the facts that humanity, hope, and oppression are all global things. At the same time, protest against that oppression and in the service of humanity and hope, that's global too. And guess what else is global? Poetry. On humanity, hope, and oppression, Ghanaian-born, British-educated, and American-based philosopher Kwame Anthony Appiah reflects on ethics on this planet in his 2007 book called Cosmopolitanism, Ethics in a World of Strangers. He contrasts our globalized world with the local world of the ancient past. And he writes, in that world, most people knew little about the ways of other tribes and could affect just a few local lives. But now, he writes, thanks to the World Wide Web of information, radio, television, telephones, the internet, we can affect lives anywhere. And we can also learn about life anywhere, too. But for the same reasons, we can, and he writes, we can raise standards of living by adopting new policies on trade and aid prevent or treat diseases with vaccines and pharmaceuticals, take measures against global climate change, encourage resistance to tyranny and a concern for the worth of each and every human life. But unfortunately, that's not all we can do. We can also ruin poor farmers by dumping our subsidized grain into their markets, or cripple industries by punitive tariffs, or deliver weapons that will kill thousands upon thousands. Long before the internet, and though in an age equally touched by global relations and still reeling from World War I that proved it, Jesse Redmond Fawcett and Hermia Liu sought to harness the positive parts of world contact in order to combat the global oppression of what she, W.E.B. Du Bois, and others called the, quote, darker peoples of the world. In her 1921 report called Impressions of the Second Pan-African Congress, she writes, and this is a long quote from Fawcett, the dream of a Pan-African Congress had already come true in 1919. Yet it was with hearts half wondering, half fearful, that we ventured to realize it afresh in 1921. So tenuous, so delicate had been its beginnings. Had the black world, although once stirred by the terrific rumblings of the Great War, relapsed into its lethargy? Then out of Africa, just before it was time to cross the Atlantic, came a letter. One of many, but this the most appealing because it was from the Egyptian Sudan. Quote, sir, we cannot come, but we are sending you this small sum, $17.32, small sum indeed, to help toward the expenses of the Pan-African Congress. Oh, sir, we are looking to you, for we need help sorely. So with this in mind, we crossed the seas, not knowing just what would be the plan of action for the Congress. For would not its members come from the four corners of the earth, and must there not of necessity be a diversity of opinion, of thought, of project? But the main thing, the great thing, was that Ethiopia's sons, through delegates, were stretching out their hands 
from all over the black and yearning world. Jesse Fawcett knew that the pain suffered by black and brown peoples and with them those of lighter shade but of the wrong religion or the wrong ethnicity or in the wrong place at the wrong time, she knew that this suffering is global and that the stretching out of hands, the crying out, the protest must be global too. But it's also poetic. Before I say a few words about our keynote speaker, I, I leave you with a few lines from Fawcett's own poetry with regard to poetry as a protest. She writes, if this is peace, this dead and leaden thing, then better far the hateful fret, the sting. Better the wound forever seeking balm than this gray calm. Is this pain's surcease? Better far the ache, the long drawn dreary day the night's white wake. Better the choking sigh, the sobbing breath, than passion's death. Her poem is called Dead Fires, and it's about how a peace that is not just is nothing more than a false peace. Or in other words, how the desire for peace must not be allowed to overtake justice, which requires sacrifice and pain sometimes. But poetry expresses that pain. Poetry can be an outlet for it. And poetry as protest keeps passion alive. And at that, it opens our eyes and allows us to envision that glorious day when globally the dark night will fade into the long-awaited joy that comes in the morning. And speaking of joy, it is mine and that of the Lawnside Historical Society to welcome today Dr. Evie Shockley, who will be our keynote speaker. Dr. Shockley is Assistant Professor of English at Rutgers University, New Brunswick. She specializes in African and African American, um, in African American and African diasporic literature. African American poetry, gender and sexuality, 20th century and contemporary poetry, and Victorian literature. She was a 2007 scholar in residence at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and a 2008 fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies. She's the author of three poetry collections, The New Black, which came out from Wesleyan University Press in 2011, a Half Red Sea, which came out from Carolina Wren Press in 2006, and The Gorgon Goddess, which also came out from Carolina Wren Press in 2001. Her book, Renegade Poetics, Black Aesthetics and Formal Innovation in African American Poetry, came out from the University of Iowa Press in 2011, and is an examination of the poets of the 1960s who led the black arts movement that defined radical thought in the later 20th century. Additionally, Dr. Shack, Dr. Shockley contributed a chapter called The Haunted Houses of New Orleans, Gothic Homelessness and African American Experience to uh, the collection Katrina's Imprint, Race and Vulnerability in America, which came out from Rutgers University Press in 2010. People who review her poetry hail her poems as innovative, nuanced, subversively engaging, and intellectual. She examines injustice in non-traditional ways and forms. Her analysis of social issues speaks to her analytical skills as an environmental lawyer. Her love of literature and, and her facility with history as well. Dr. Shockley earned her PhD from Duke University. We're akin that way. Uh, she earned her law degree from the University of Michigan and an undergraduate degree in English and creative writing from Northwestern University. She taught at Wake Forest University before coming to join Rutgers' English department faculty several years ago. Um, with that, uh, it's our extreme pleasure to welcome to the podium Dr. Evie Shockley. Hi, 
How's everybody? Good. Good? All right, get ready to get better. Poetry. Yeah. Um, it is a, a real pleasure to be here. Um, I want to thank right off the, the bat, um, Linda Shockley, who, um, where'd she go? <laughs> there you are. <laughs> um, who um, communicated the invitation uh, to be here to me today and to the Lawndale Historical Society as a whole and um, all the other members of the Lawn, uh, Lawndale, Lawnside, I'm sorry, uh, the Lawnside um, community who helped make this day possible. It's clear that a lot of work and thought have gone into this um, annual event and um, it's really a pleasure to join in um, celebrating the life and work of Jessie Redmond Fawcett in her hometown. Um, I would say um, when I was in college at Northwestern, it was long enough ago that it was still the case that African American literature was um, rarely taught or not reliably or consistently taught. Um, so I felt lucky to have a course in American ethnic literature in which we uh, read some African American novels. Um, in this one 10 week quarter, we probably read seven or eight, um, seven or eight novels as a whole. And um, among them were uh, a, a novel by Toni Morrison, Sula, and believe it or not, and sort of uh, unpredictable that this would happen, one of them was Plum Bun by Jessie Redmond Fawcett. And that was my introduction to her work. I was a fan immediately and um, have remained so ever since. Uh, so I'm really grateful for that stroke of luck. Um, I should say also before um, getting into the into the, the the sort of the substance of this this talk that I um, just last month ran into a friend of mine who I found out is another um, native daughter poet of the Lawnside area, um, also back when it was still Snow Hill, and that is uh, Kate Russian. So I bring you greetings from from one of your other poets. Um, so African American poetry has been from its inception a medium of political critique and dissent. But the aesthetic style and political substance of the poems has varied greatly over the, the course of this long tradition. As an African American poet writing in the 21st century, I have a rich and diverse body of work to draw upon for um, my literary models as well as um, a tradition that, that gives me uh, an overview, a really textured overview of the history and culture of black people in the US. In my two books of poetry, I return again and again to black experience and the poets who have made the struggle for freedom, justice, and equality the subject of brilliant and powerful poems. And one of the things that I've become increasingly interested in tracing and illuminating are the connections between black racial politics and environmental justice. In some ways, this may trace back to the work I did as an environmental lawyer um, in what seems like another lifetime. Um, but it also comes out of reading the work of African American poets um, very closely in my research. My book, Renegade Poetics, which um, was referenced earlier, um, it includes a, a section that looks at the ways certain African American poets have been inspired to write poems that explore the complicated relationship of black people to what we call the natural world, okay? Modern philosophy in Western thought has relied upon certain binaries to organize the world. One of those binaries is blackness and whiteness in a racial sense, but also in, um, in a broader sense, the, the colors and their associations in biblical traditions and so forth have always been set up as opposing whiteness and blackness as the opposite of one another. Another binary that Western thought relies upon opposes culture and nature, that is um, civilization, the man-made world on one side 
as an opposite of the natural world, what we um, usually think of as out there, outside somewhere, outside the city, outside the building, um, where we find trees and flowers. Um, those two binaries actually meet up and work together in some really interesting and troubling ways. And what I've been interested in is um, thinking about how whiteness is also associated with civilization and culture, those, those histories of man's greatest achievements, where blackness in this, this long history of, of Western thought has been associated with the savage, the, the primitive, um, jungle, nature, uncontrolled emotion, and those kinds of things. Those binaries that, that haunt our history are taken up in poems by African American poets and thought about, written against, worked through, complicated, um, exploded, if you will. And those kinds of poems have really interested me. What I want to do is, um, I, I should back up a second. In the process of breaking down the, the sort of the overlap between those two binaries, whiteness and blackness and culture and nature, black poets have not wanted to let go of the natural world as we think of it because there's also a long history of African American participation in and enjoyment of the natural world, even under slavery. The relationship of black people to the land um, is, is an important one and can't be erased. Um, the relationship of black people to um, owning land when that became possible, or at least the attempt to own land, and um, to maintaining a sense of the, the kind of southern roots that, that um, the African American population can trace uh, in many cases before the great migrations took people out west, up north, and to the Midwest. What I'd like to do in the, in the brief time I have this afternoon is share a series of my own poems that engage in different ways with blackness and nature, um, with racial and environmental politics, and contextualize them in relationship to the tradition of African American poetry and the historical and current issues that concern me and many others. Um, so what I'm gonna do is just weave um, some of my work together with some, with some conversation about um, the things that inspire it and um, the models that it draws upon. And I hope you will be able to, to, to hear some things that, it, that you can enjoy. The first poem I want to read is um, the poem that opens my first book, A Half Red Sea. It's called Possibilities of Poetry Upon Her Death, and it's an elegy for Gwendolyn Brooks. Have any of you heard of Gwendolyn Brooks? Okay, it's a wonderful poet, one of my um, first and primary inspirations and models. Possibilities of Poetry Upon Her Death. Ars Poetica, Rough Ship, Drag me from world to brutal word, mental passage, right. Be a whale of a sound, surfacing to fountain dark water found in valleys of shadow of breath. I will brook no evil, for thou art not gone, Gwen, and poems made of tears evaporate. When the drops dry, scrape gray lines of salt and dreams from brown faces. Right, melt like a verb into this rich white earth of paper. Grow an oeuvre from a need. I thought that poem would be a, 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 a good place to start because the images that um, it draws upon not only include biblical imagery, um, one of the sources of consolation for many people um, in times of sorrow, and I was very sad when um, Brooks died in 2000. Um, but it also includes um, metaphors of, of water and, um, and earth and growth, rebirth. Um, and that is one way that African American poetry has drawn in a positive sense upon nature um, over a long course of years. I also thought it would be a great idea to bring Brooks into the conversation 
because um, she's not known as a po protest poet or a political poet, but one of the things that she and I have in common is a way of writing about the things that troubles us that, um, that rather than making direct statements of protest, works through memory and um, complication and um, illusions and irony to invite readers to think about the things that are troubling and come to some of their own conclusions, right? Um, Gwendolyn Brooks is also noteworthy in this case for writing at a time when black life, she wrote about the south side of Chicago, um, a black, uh, more than neighborhood, um, at a time when black life was still considered not poetic. Um, despite the work of the New Negro Renaissance, or Harlem Renaissance um, that, that we've been hearing about, um, that message had largely been forgotten during the 1940s and 50s when Brooks was starting her career. She did not forget, though. Brooks had grown up reading County Cullen's anthology of Harlem Renaissance poetry, Caroling Dark. And she, as a young writer, um, not much older than some of you, met um, James Weldon Johnson, the author of the Negro National Anthem, which we sang earlier, and Langston Hughes. Um, and um, Hughes, in particular, became a mentor of hers um, and helped her get her career on, on the road. So um, I wanted to, to bring Brooks into this conversation. Another woman poet, African-American woman poet, who's been important to me is the woman whose book opens the African-American literary tradition, Phyllis Wheatley. Um, Wheatley was nine years old when she was brought on a ship, the ship named Phyllis, for which she was named, um, to Boston uh, to, be, to enter a life of slavery. This poem that I want to read to you is very, very short, um, but it tells her life in two ways, you might say. The poem is called Bio-Autography instead of Autobiography, right? Because she didn't get to tell her life story um, in, a, in, in a narrative sense when she was, when she was alive. This, this poem gives us her bio, the things that people often talk about her life, and her autography, her life writing, that, um, that, might, that puts those same ideas in terms that she might have felt. Bio-autography, or 18th century multiculturalism. Found in Africa, dawned in freedom, raised in Boston, rose in slavery, schooled in Greek, grew in God, published in England, died in poverty. And those two kinds of um, ways of talking about her life suggest some of the tensions between the ways that Africans have been constructed in the, U in the New World, the US, and the ways that we might think of ourselves. Um, Wheatley, although she was writing when she was enslaved to a family, um, the Wheatley family in Boston, did not write primarily in protest against slavery. And that always surprises some people who are new to her work. She wrote more often in protest against British tyranny over the US. She was, um, you might say, one of America's um, earliest patriots and, and a freedom writer in that sense, in the same sense that we think of Patrick Henry um, or Thomas Paine. That's a really interesting thing to think about. It gives you some sense of what she was able to do as a writer while being enslaved. And one wonders, because she died very shortly after being set free. Um, she was a, a, a slightly ill person, and she, she died of, I think, a, a lung-related condition. Um, very within like a year or two after she was freed. She, we wonder what she would have written about as someone who, like some of the authors of the slave narratives that we know about, um, who, if she had been able to write 
after she was, she was not enslaved anymore. I want to switch to a poem from my um, second collection that is indebted to Langston Hughes. And we've already heard a, a great deal of mention of him today. He's such an important poet. Um, like Fawcett, Langston Hughes cared about black people not just in the US, but in a global context. And a poem that he wrote in the 1930s makes this clear. He is giving us a poem, very short poem, in which the question for him is, how do you make protest poetic? And here's the poem. It's so short. I always read it before I read my own poem. Johannesburg Mines by Langston Hughes. In the Johannesburg Mines, there are 240,000 natives working. What kind of poem would you make out of that? 240,000 natives working in the Johannesburg Mines. That's his whole poem. The poem I wrote, inspired by that, tries to think about that question that's in the center of his poem. And what I chose, the reason I wanted to read this poem today, in addition to bringing Hughes into the conversation, is because I chose a form for my poem that is really deeply connected to nature, the haiku. Have any, has anyone written a haiku or read a haiku? They're really short. Um, and they're, they're a Japanese form that, um, in its most traditional sense, looks out at nature and tries to describe really precisely what you see and um, let a sort of an observation lead to some sort of a wisdom. This is my poem, Statistical Haiku, or How Do They Discount Us? Let Me Count the Ways. Only three out of 100 black boys entering kindergarten will graduate college in the night sky shooting stars. Every day, a black person under 20 years old commits suicide, plucked magnolia blossoms, funereal perfume. A black man is 700% more likely than a white man to be sentenced to prison, scattered thunder sh showers in May. Every three minutes, a black child is born into poverty. Pine needles line the forest floor. So that's a poem that really tries to, to think about nature as offering some metaphors that we can draw a connection to um, our lives, our situations. Um, another poem that that demonstrates, I think, the tension between nature poetry and, and black poetry for so many people is, um, is this one. It's called Where You Were Planted. And I wanted to read it, um, or I wanted to mention in, in introducing this poem, another Harlem Renaissance era woman poet, Anne Spencer, who was like me from the South. It's a, one of the things that the Harlem Renaissance name does is it gears our thoughts towards New York and towards Harlem. But the, um, the New Negro Renaissance, which is the term I, I often use um, to sort of broaden that association, it was actually peopled by um, black people from all over the country. Langston Hughes himself, before he came to Harlem, was from Kansas. Um, Ann Spencer lived her whole life in Lynchburg, Virginia and got to be a part of the Harlem Renaissance or the New Negro Renaissance because writers like Hughes, like James Weldon Johnson, coming south couldn't stay in uh, public um, hotel accommodations. That this was during segregation. And they would stay at her house on their way further south. So um, that's how her poetry began to be published. James Weldon Johnson published her first poem in The Crisis, like Langston Hughes. Um, she and I have in common a love for nature and a love for the South that is always haunted by some of the things that, that um, have happened in the South um, that, um, that you'll hear referenced in the last stanza of this poem. Where you are planted. 
He's high as a Georgia pine, my father would say, half laughing. Southern trees as measure, metaphor, highways lined with kudzu covered southern trees. Fuchsia, lavender, white, light pink, purple. Crepe myrtle bouquets burst open on sturdy branches of skin smooth bark, my favorite southern trees. 100 degrees in the shade, we settle into still pools of humidity, moss dark beneath live oaks. Southern heat makes us grateful for southern trees. Maples in our front yard flew in spring on helicopter wings. In fall, we splashed in colored leaves, but never sought sap from these southern trees. Frankly, my dear, that's a magnolia, I tell her, fingering the deep green, nearly plastic leaves, amazed at how little a northern girl knows about southern trees. I've never forgotten the charred, bitter fruit of holidays poplars, nor will I. It's part of what makes me Evie. I grew up in the shadow of southern trees. How many of you know the song by Billie Holiday, Southern Trees? Strange fruit, right? Southern trees bear strange fruit. That is something I, ha I felt I had to wrap into that poem, even as it was celebrating the things about um, the South and the natural world that I love, that is always in the back of my mind. It makes me think of a poem by Lucille Clifton, one of the teachers of, um, uh, that I, I had um, coming up as a, as a younger poet. She has a poem about the trouble with trying to write a nature poem for her. She says, always beneath that poem lies an other poem. An other poem meaning a poem that's, that's going to be not a little different from the traditional nature poems. Um, I have two more poems that I want to read. Um, one is a prose poem, and um, it makes a reference at the end to the um, Hurricane Katrina aftermath. And I thought about reading this poem when um, uh, I was introduced and um, the mention of the, the Katrina volume came up. It brought this poem to mind and I thought it would be a good poem to talk about, to illustrate the ways that poetry can make talking about hard subjects, like some of the ones that um, have come up today, easier to hear and to process and to think about. Poems can invite you in not only through um, words and ideas, but through song. Lyric poetry, as we call it, connects to music in a deep, long historical way. And this is a poem that draws on that root connection between music and poetry. Um, it's called Duck, Duck, Redux. And part of the reason for the title, which I hope you will recognize as a play on a, a name of a children's game, is that it was written when my nieces were born, about six years ago now. Um, I was fortunate to be able to come, uh, go to Ohio where my sister lives, and to spend the first year, uh, first months, uh, month or so of their lives um, with them and my mom. And I got to hear her sing to them some of the same songs she sang to my sister and me when we were very young. That song got into my head and it got mixed up with the things that I was thinking about in terms of the world that we live in, the world that my nieces will grow up in, and my hopes for them. Um, we live in a time of great change around the way we think about race, and this is a poem that is interested in that. There are two epigraphs. Those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. And that's George Santayana. Those who cannot forget the past are destined to remix it. That's me. Duck, duck, redux. This is the way we wash our face, wash our face, wash our face. This is the way we wash our face so early in the morning. This is the way we segregate our schools in 1896. This is the way we segregate our schools in 2007. Mary had a little lamb, 
a bad, bad black sheep with three bags full of wool. It followed her to school one day, work one day, Wimbledon one day. It followed her to church one day, which was against the rule. This is the way we patrol the roads in the antebellum south. This is the way we patrol the streets in our shiny New York. Cue wedding bell. Oh, bring back my Shawnee to me. This is the way we appropriate black culture in the post-reconstruction period. This is the way we appropriate black culture in the 21st century. This little piggy got, went to market, got mad bling for spitting whack rhymes and calling women hoes and still wound up crying wee, wee, wee all the way home. This is the way we use a noose in Jim Crow America. This is the way we use a noose in Gina, Louisiana. Little blues boy, come blow your horn. I'm sorry to tell you, but his horn's done gone. And as for the boy who used to blow so sweet, he's under a mountain of debt, working for minimum wage. This is the way we wash our hands of you historically, throw you into the Atlantic, spray you with Birmingham hoses. This is the way we wash our hands of you today with jerry-rigged levees. So early, so, so early in the millennium. Thank you. And because that's a hard poem to end on, I want to close with a very short poem um, that also brings song lyrics and um, references to music into a scene of nature. Um, it's a reminder, it's a poem that's a reminder of how nature can be so healing um, for the human spirit. It's called, You Must Walk This Lonesome. Say hello to moon leads you into trees as thick as folk on Easter pews. Dark but venture through, amazing was blind but now fireflies glittering, dangling from evergreens like Christmas oracles. Soon you meet the riverbank, down by the riverside water baptizes your feet. Moon bursts back in, low, yellow, swing low, sweet chariot of cheese shines on in the river. Cup hands and sip what never saw inside of peace be still. Mix in your tears, moon distills distress like yours, so nobody knows the trouble it causes. Pull up a log and sit until your empty is full, your straight is wool, your death is yule. Moonshine will do that, barter with you, what you got for what you need. Draw from the river like it is well with my soul, O oh moon you croon and home you go. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shockley, for that inspiring, that really inspiring talk and discussion of poetry, and discussion of the power of the spoken and the sung word. And with that, um, it's, it's actually time to move on to being inspired a little more. We're not done yet. I'd like to call up uh, one of our favorite people here at the Jesse Redmond Fawcett Literary Series, um, and that would be uh, the spoken word and other medium as well, but the spoken word artist Napalm to come up and give us a rendition. Thank you. So this is National Poetry Month. Make some noise for National Poetry Month. Yes. And um, for you young folks, and not just for you young folks who are interested in poetry, um, the, in the Philadelphia Enquirer, um, in their celebration of National Poetry Month, uh, they have a Calling All Poets where you can submit your poetry, and your poetry will be published on the 28th. So today is, so you have time. So it, it could be, yeah, it could be your poem for this uh, 
uh, affair that you might want to submit. But anyway, um, the information is here. Um, I'll have it with me if any of you uh, are interested. And as I understand, it's not just for kids. So for some of you adult uh, bards, you may want to check this out. And um, so I am once again uh, grateful and uh, humbled that uh, Linda has asked me um, to come and uh, introduce our winners and share one poem with you uh, before we get started. And speaking of singing poetry, um, one of my favorite poets is uh, Oscar Brown Jr. And in 1968, he came out with an album a wonderful album of poetry and song titled Sin and Soul. And um, I don't think there's a poem on the entire album that I don't like and like to kind of memorize and share when I go around. Um, but this one is titled That Dare. And uh, I want to share it with you. <clears throat> Hey, daddy, what that dare? And why that under dare? And oh, daddy, oh, hey, daddy, look it over there. Hey, what they doing there? And where they going there? And daddy, can I have that big elephant over there? Hey, who that in my chair? And why she doing there? And oh, daddy, oh, day, daddy, can I go over there? Hey, daddy, what's a square? And where do we get air? And daddy, can I have that big Oedipin over there? My quizzical kid, man, he doesn't want anything hid. He's forever demanding to know who, what, and why, and where. Inquisitive child, and sometimes the questions get wild, like, daddy, can I have that big Oedipin over there? Don't want to comb my hair. And where my teddy bear? And oh, daddy, oh, hey, daddy, look at that cowboy coming over there. Hey, can I have a pair of boots like that to wear? And daddy, can I have that big Oedipin over there? The time will march. The years will go. The little fella's going to need to know. And I've got to tell him what he needs to know. Help him along so he'll know right from wrong. Gotta make them strong. You give your kid the best, and you hope he'll pass the test. When you finally send him out into the world somewhere, but though he's grown, I'm betting I'll never forget him saying, and daddy, can I have that big elephant over there? Aww. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, um, we have some certificates and awards on that table over there. And I do understand that some of our winners are not here. But of course, uh, I'm going to give them a shout out anyway. And perhaps, as in the past, we'll have some teachers maybe read the, stu the students' work. Um, so we'll see. All right, seventh grade. Um, the poem is titled, You Think You Know, representing Freedom Academy Charter School in Camden, Jasmine Giles. Let's show us some love, show us some love. So, I'm going to read this one time. Uh, spirit of the Renaissance Poetry Competition, Poetry as Protest, in honor of Jesse Redmond Fawcett, seventh grade. You think you know the pain as children go through, living in a high murder rate city? You think you know how us Camden folk are? just because you saw bad statistics about us. 
You think you know how it feels to watch your back every day. Paranoid to walk down certain streets and alleys. You think you know what we see walking down abandoned streets. Seeing drug dealers, prostitutes, needles, guns is all too graphic. You think you know how frustrating it is for a child to go out their way to apply to a good school, a good, great school, but the school doesn't even open their applications because of the city they live in. Since you know all that, you should have known the, the changes we are trying to make, trying to prove those statistics wrong. Now you must be thinking, what is this girl talking about? Because you're judging us by what you heard but not seen. You had no experience to witness our life and what we go through. So now you're, now you're second guessing what you were thinking, aren't you? It's the children at Freedom Academy, Leap Academy, do season and Sumner. We're all making that stride to change those statistics, proving others wrong. We are the future and you're judging us by our past. Not everyone fits those stereotypes, thinking we're all the same. Just watch, you'll see. You think you know, you thought you knew, but now you're stuck wondering. So who knows, one day she'll be up here and, and be our keynote speaker, uh, like the awesome Dr. Shockley. Is this on? One, 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 one. One, one, one. So um, one of the judges for uh, Jasmine's uh, poem was Louise Wright, retired educator, pianist, and harpist, life member of the Historical Society. And she wrote in her comments, uh, you think you know is a voice that needs to be heard. It had great content. All right. All right. I agree. Oh, raise your hand. There she is. Oh, there she is. Hello. All righty. Um, representing the eighth grade. Um, Dwight D. Eisenhower Middle School in Berlin Township. Angelo Castoriato. Did I pronounce that right? How can you come to a poetry reading without the copy of your poem? I just so happen to have it right here. You're not going to get off that easy. All right, let's see. Let's see. I have a stack of poems here, so you might want to look over my shoulder. Here it is. Is that it, right? Yes. There you go. All right, young man, have at it. Day after day, pain through pain, I wake up exhausted. My routine's always the same. My book bag's heavy. I'm ready for school. I have no one to walk with, and it will be a fool to call me cool. I walk in silence. My headphones in. He's looking at me. I'm looking at him. I feel like dead weight. I know what he wants. His homework I did. Thank God it's all done. He still pushes me hard. I fall to the ground. I feel another blow. I wince, but don't make a sound. He takes his things, my lunch money included. But I was prepared for this. I brought ex extra food. I finished my day. Luckily, I didn't see him. But I'm not looking forward to tomorrow, a whole new beating. But as I start going home, I get to thinking. Is what they told me true? Is my life not worth living? Let's see. Clinton Higgs Jr., Peter Mott reenactor, former borough councilman, Judge Angelo's poem, and in his comments he wrote, it is obvious that the primary theme was protesting the serious social concern of bullying, very compelling and sensitive, using the first person narrative to portray the victimization of a student on one particular day. This poem was both effective and heartfelt. Yes. Thank you, agree? All righty, also representing the eighth grade, uh, Longside Public School, yay. Come on, show your love for Longside Public School. 
Tamir Robertson. Good job, Tamir. I will not be undermined. I refuse to be unseen in a body of people eager to. I refuse to be left behind. I will not give you a reason to underestimate my academic levels. You see, I must excel in everything that I profess to do. I do it very well, and I am more than present. I am functional. In all time, and anything that I do not understand, I took an extra 20 minutes to underline, and yes, I am a Victorian. From the flip of my tongue to the strike of my pen, I refuse to be stereotyped or give it or give in to misguided mentalities of, ign of ignorance. I am willing to learn, I am willing to share, to be educated and innovative and contentious enough to bear it. The challenge of battling hypocrisy, I refuse to be anything other than me. Tamir Robertson, gifted, talented, brilliant, only 14. I give you this protest for the misguided by way of poetry. Comments from Mr. Uh, Higgs about Tamir's uh, poem. The theme of protest and misguided deal with not succumbing to ignorance and maintaining excellence in all endeavors of life. It was both different and clever. My recommendation is that because of this unique perspective, the author should continue to work on this poem or theme. That is his challenge. All right, and moving along to ninth and 10th grades, uh, representing, oh, they're all representing Triton High. <laughs> Triton High is in the house, right? <laughs> okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Alana Dawes will be reading Down the Fall. All right, I know who you are, but for those who don't, would you let the folks know who you are? Sure. I'm Lisa McCook. I'm an English teacher at Triton High School. <laughs> Get an English teacher, sir. We have a lot of Alana's little brother is having his first birthday party today, so he, she was unable to come. And her poem is entitled Downfall. Great nations so big and bold, yet no one sees through its holes, often looked to as a haven, but its own people need saving. Killing of our brothers, senseless cruelty, ragged people line the streets, cold shoulders shudders with defeat. Our powerful leaders feed us lies, and lend a blind eye as we all slowly die. As the clock slowly ticks by, as our nation seemingly thrives, inside our walls no one can hear our cries. Ghostly figures try to set things straight, but we can never power through the underlying hate. Lines are drawn, battle found, our people are never sound, starving alone, while the leaders ring out the rest of our people's mights, only to be given away in the night. We lose the fight once again, the common people see the end. Our feeble cries are overruled as the government is so cruel. The people push to the side so they can do what they do best, throwing our crumbling world at home into a tumbling spiral. Each day we owe more, lose more, hear the reaper pound on our door. Let out the cold as we dig our way out of this dark hole, watching our leaders dine on wine. Why we lust what is equally ours feeling our ancestors spark ignite in our weary minds. Our actions cause repetition. No one seems up to stop this mission. What will our home come to, or are we all destined to live in a lie? Mm -hmm. 
to do it. And I will give Alana her just dues on Monday. <laughs> Dr. Keith Green, LHS board member and associate professor of English at Rutgers in Camden, judged of Alana's poem, and the comments are, powerful, energetic poem, varied and specific images. And, um, found out that this next young lady happens to be the daughter of a good buddy of mine. And uh, her name is Nessie Joseph. <laughs> you, know, you know your papa's really proud of you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Why you had to take my life? We started out with so much love and care. Every part of you with me you would share. I thought we would always be together. Through every joy, through every storm, we will weather. You will help me and I will help you. There be no stopping us forever through and through. My confidant, my friend, connected we would be, not just nine months, but to the end. I thought I would fill your life with great memories and joy, never knowing it would be full of strife from such a sweet, perfect boy. If your decision was right, why can't you sleep at night? Why every little boy's face you pass and see to such emptiness, a place of sorrow where your boy would be. Now every day, every month, every year, you wake up with your pillow wet with tears. A new life full of promise, full of hope, the world will never know. Ideas and inventions will never grow. I guess because you felt you were at the end of your rope. So the next time you were in a heat of passion, think of my life, show me your unborn some compassion. You never gave us a chance. You never gave my life much thought. Silly things, things meaningless, you take a stand. But something so precious meant nothing. Even though a grueling, uh, useless battle I fought. So if you don't want to be a mother, think before you lay down with another. I'm sorry I brought such misery, such strife, but why did you have to take my life? Now, you know they say the fruit don't fall far from the tree, so she must get her talent from her mom. <laughs> Cause her dad. <laughs> All right, so um, uh, Dr. Green wrote of uh, Nessie's poem, uh, creative use of a child's voice and perspective, shoes. Lots of promise. Mm -hmm. I agree. And um, first place from Triton High School, Alexis Way. Right. Alexis. The strength of her, heavy eyelids, fighting sleep, the pages now a blur. Would I have to push so hard if I were not a her? Centuries of teaching little girls to smile, to paint their pretty faces, equality, denial. I have strength, I am not weak, I have a voice and I will speak. When I was born, the doctor said, she's a beauty, she'll knock them dead. It's not my looks that weld the gun, I'm chasing you, you better run. When I catch you, you will see the strength of her empowers me. Who is her? She is free. She's a woman, she is me. I'm so nervous. <laughs> Is that your mom? Yes. All right. I'm yeah. You all can't see mom's face, but she's like turning red tears. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. The power and the passion of poetry. <laughs> Woo! I'm sorry. That's all right. No, you, you're, my mom would probably embarrass me. <laughs> I'm trying not to. Oh my goodness. Look at mom. <laughs> tears of joy. All right, we're going to move to 11th and 12th grades. Um, Sandra Turner Barnes. Mom is just having a fit here. 
you. I had a poem published when I was 14, and that, that's one of my good things in me. And she's taken in for that, and I'm so proud. That is I'm wonderful. So proud. Wonderful, wonderful. Wow. Oh, my goodness. Okay, um, Sandra Turner Barnes, who is um, executive director of the Camden County Culture and Heritage Commission, um, judge these uh, next three. Uh, third place, also representing Triton, Chris Baylor. Show your love for Chris Baylor. Here he comes. Right, Chris. <clears throat> Listen up, hear me roar, align with the cause. Look around from sky to ground, recognize the flaws. Father to brother, sister to mother, other to other, united we stand. Visions and voices, denials and choices, this poem rejoices in reach of a hand. The written voice of them, of me, they fought, we fight through poetry. Dreams are hope, the poems are past, devouring from first to last. Langston wrote of dreams deferred, Martin dreamed till he was heard. A pen that bleeds and beats and rhymes, a poem from a leader's time. Now I live with this insight, a voice to speak, a pen to write. With this poem, we take a stand, soul to soul, hand in hand. Sandra wrote an exceptional poem that dances across the page, screaming out through poetry. Chris. Okay. Um, also representing Triton, with a poem titled Words, Rashawn Griffin. Rashawn Griffin. Here he comes. All right, Rashawn. See what you got, man. Uh, words. My words, my voice, locked in a pen. Black as ink, I can, I can. My skin is banned, yet with my hand, I write about the promised land. With open eyes, I see, I see. The justice has abandoned me, but in my heart, I am free, screaming out through poetry. I am angry, full of hurt. Tears have stained my tattered shirt. Turned away, denied, refused, pushed and shoved, cursed and abused. When I run, they see a thief. They turn their heads in disbelief. When I rhyme, all is sublime. They cup, they cup their ears to hear the charm. They say, the poet speaks, hear the rhythm of his cheeks, rhyming echoes of the past, in his words, the future's cast. He said, shh, the poet speaks. And Sandra wrote in her comments, excellent, powerful description of poetry's purpose. True protest here. All right, and we are down to our first, our last, <laughs> our last reader, uh, first place, uh, representing Burlington County Institute of Technology. It's a mouthful. Destiny B. Riley. Destiny. Better than that. African American, Negroes, colored, black. For far too long, we've been under attack. Not revealing our true selves, but just keeping it in, all because the color of our skin. Human beings not expressing themselves, barely noticed, overlooked, like another book on the shelf. Being born black doesn't mean be afraid to live life 
or people should view us with anger and strife. We are all part of God's beautiful display, longing for the day when we're actually treated that way. Tell me why some think there's only one good race and the rest should be ashamed to show their face. Who has the right to give one race a label or deny them a seat at a certain table? We weren't allowed to sit on the front of the bus. The melanin in our skin, was that the big fuss? Told the best we could do was work in kitchens, raised to believe that's fact, but it was only fiction. As a proud black American, I say we accomplished so much that our ancestors could only dream could be touched. Equality is what the Harlem Renaissance worked for to break down racial barriers and open up doors. From controversy over black to live in an all white residence to 2008, we, we elect our first black president. No matter how many times they watched us fall, we risen and wrong, we proved them all. Asking my generation where we make a wrong turn after all we've been through, were the lessons even learned? Stuck on shoes, a bad influence, like a wad of gum. Education is available, there's no excuse to act dumb. We've been given opportunities where others didn't have a chance. Why stay back when there's a choice to advance? Stop saying YOLO and start making wise decisions. Dr. Keene had a dream so you could have a vision. Let your actions start reflecting who you truly are. Let's remove the limits and raise the bar. Refuse to let the culture hold you back. The truth is, you're better than that. And I believe that all of the students who came up here to read, they're all better than that, and they're going to be better than that if they continue to write. So Destiny, uh, Sandra's comments about your poem was, excellent, well-crafted protest poem, rhythmic, informative, fabulous. And on that note, a nice round of applause for all of you. It's not easy to come up here and read before strangers. All right, thanks again to Napalm for presenting us with that poem and then the wonderful prizes. And thanks to all our poets. Give yourselves another round of applause. Also a special thanks to the judges who helped make this possible. And I just want to remind you of all that stuff I mentioned earlier. Um, want to remind those of you who are interested in learning more about under, the Underground Railroad and Underground Railroad Museums to check out the Peter Mott House here in Lawnside. Also, if you're interested to check out the Delaware Coali the Underground Railroad Coalition of Delaware and their annual meeting on April 29th. And I want to remind all of you young artists to pick up one of these as you go out over there and participate in the art contest being offered by artist Fran Dijon, who I noticed is in the back of the room over there. So if you could just stand up. So feel free to speak to him directly about his contest, too. Um, and do not forget to fill out those surveys so we can keep doing this, so we can keep celebrating poetry, so we can keep celebrating you, so we can keep celebrating Jesse Redmond Fawcett. So fill out those surveys, drop them in the box over there. And with that, I want to um, bring up our final two speakers for some closing remarks. Um, do, we have, do we have Sandra Turner Barnes with us, one of the judges? We don't have Sandra. So um, we will have our closing remarks then from president of the Lawnside Historical Society, Linda Shockley. Thank you so much. Thank you 
Cord Whitaker for being our Master of Ceremonies. I want to thank uh, Dr. Shockley certainly for coming. She is no relation. Um, and, and I should tell you that it's interesting that she said she uh, knows Kate Russian who grew up here. Um, Dr. Beavers last night said he knows Kate Russian who grew up here and now lives in Connecticut. And I believe it was Kate who actually sent me a clipping from a newspaper several years ago when Dr. Shockley was honored for being an exceptional teacher and said, you really ought to have this professor come. And I, I was thinking, wow, people will think she's related to me. <laughs> but she's wonderful and we're so glad to have met your acquaintance and we hope that we'll continue um, to be connected to you. I, I want to acknowledge the teachers who are here with their students, and I just want them to raise their hands. Um, Ms. McCunfino, <laughs> Jessica Kate from the Freedom Academy. I'd, I'd also like to acknowledge members of the Historical Society, um, starting with our judges, uh, Dr. Dr. Keith Green, who's also a board member, Louise Wright, who's a retired educator. Colton Higgs could not be here today. He was not feeling well. Um, and Sandra Turner Barnes, who was also a judge um, and executive director of the Camden County Cultural and Heritage Commission. We also have members of a, a society here. Our um, Vice President Joyce Fowler, you met. Our recording secretary is Cassandra Butler. She's here. Um, we also have uh, Raymond Fussell, who takes wonderful pictures and took a lot of pictures last night and probably took a lot today. And he's instantaneous, so that will probably be on the internet uh, this evening and, and hopefully uh, in the papers. We also intend to, to publish the names of our, our winners. And I also want to acknowledge our uh, board member, um, Jacqueline Miller Bentley, who is uh, new to our board and uh, we're so pleased to have her. She is a retired uh, principal from uh, Philadelphia school system and she's been a, a wonderful addition to our board of directors, as has uh, been Dr. Green. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not acknowledge the reason that we are honoring Jesse Redmond Fawcett is that nine years ago, someone came to the Historical Society and said, this lady was from one side, and we ought to do something to honor her. We, had, we really didn't know anything about her yet. We called ourselves a Historical Society, and that's William Walden, he and his wife Sharon um, Walden. <laughs> Oh, Wave your hand yeah. so we're really indebted to him because we would not be doing this if it were not for him. Uh, once again, I want to thank you all. If there are any other student poets who participate in this competition and you weren't acknowledged earlier, just wave your hand. We had 105 submissions this year from all three counties, more submissions than we've ever had. So. The students who are honored, the 12 students who are honored, did exceptional work because you were judged against a field of 105 other poets. So you really should keep writing, keep writing, keep expressing yourself, keep reading, and using everything that you have to accomplish what you will.